No Harry Potter movie is good. You need a Snyder God. Oh, sorry. Just walk in front of you here. I'm gonna put my pop down. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna put this here. <laughs> Universal needs to sue Sony. Hey, I'm an idiot. I was fired from Fox. Let me go. <laughs> I'd like actually to see Venom just crush Spider Man. Hello, everyone. So I'm back today and I'm here to talk about a movie which everyone absolutely needs to go out of support and needs to go watch in theaters um, immediately because it is really that good. And this movie, of course, is Simulant, which is a one and a half hour personal, small scale sci fi Shakespearean tragedy. Yep, all those words describe that movie. That's, a, that's like the level of sophistication. I use the word Shakespeare, which Shakespeare, which means it has to be a sophisticated movie, because I've been told that all those tragedies are, are sophisticated. So you know, I'm just going with what I'm being told. Anyways, first, I really want to praise the truly phenomenal performances that this movie gave us. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna start with Simu Liu, who starred in starred in his role, which is not the typical kind of role he plays. Um, but his ability to kind of just portray characters so effectively, even outside of what we typically see him in, um, mainly and probably most specifically Marvel, it was it was just really spectacular, and it really speaks to his versatility as an actor and his ability to play a wide range of characters effectively. Right, and that's the key word there is effectively. And you know, we sometimes see actors who have played you know one or two types of roles and try to play a completely different role and film miserably, right? You, you know, look at our Robert Downey Jr. Call him RDJ. Um, but Robert Downey Jr., who um, in Doolittle kind of, you know, sucked. Or The Rock, who in every role that requires more than just delivering a funny script, you know, sucks. For example, Black Adam, Skyscraper, um, Rampage. I feel like I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to. The second, but that was really the Simu Liu performance. Like he really just did all of that and was versatile and was amazing. Um, but the second performance I want to look at is Sam Worthington's performance, uh, it was as what I would call the kind of government military badass role. This actually provides uh, great contrast to the point I made about Simu Liu uh, because this role was kind of closer to Sam's other roles. Mainly, you look at Avatar, right? Where he plays a very similar type of character and this isn't a knock on his performance because he was great in his role but it's a compliment more to the um obviously it's a compliment to him for being good and acting well but i think it's even more of a compliment to like the directing and the and the casting of this movie because you know you see these these cat you see these kind of you know either their studio decisions or their other or their director decisions or their casting director decisions Right where they basically bring in these people who to play these very different roles than maybe what their strengths are, and obviously if they're sucking, it's gonna hurt the quality of the movie. Right, and some of these people, you know, the best roles for them are things that they're really really good at. Right, and instead of trying to you know make them fit into another role, like trying to put a square in a in a square block and a round peg or whatever the saying is. But I think, I I think he you know you. He didn't. They didn't put him in a situation where he he could have a weaker performance. They gave him the opportunity to, you know, do what he does well, and he did it amazing, and it really helped the movie because obviously if he acts well, then the movie looks good, right? And I mean, if you want a perfect example of, of weaker uh, putting great actors in very terrible situations, um, you know, Natalie Portman in, in Thor, pretty much the entire Thor franchise, maybe except for Love and Thunder, and uh, Rachel McAdams, obviously, and Doctor Strange, both of those being roles where, and maybe even the entire Star Wars, pre Natalie Portman in the Star Wars prequels, because that is probably, a, again, you know, you're putting people in the roles where they aren't really going to thrive because they're just better than that, and you, or even Hayden Christensen in Star Wars, you know, making, make give a sand m monologue um, is not ideal for that movie or any movie. But unlike those roles, he they put uh, Sam in a role which was gave him put him in the perfect position to thrive and, and just do what he does best, and it 
helped the movie and it made the movie look good, right? So at the end of the day, that's the goal. And then obviously, the other big performance I want to talk about is um, is Robbie and Mill's performance, and he was obviously fantastic. There were so many things I could say about him, um, but since I've already spent way too much time talking about the other two, I'm just gonna say Robbie has set the bar for. Uh, for the simulant kind of movements and actions, and I think everyone else kind of had to live up to that bar because he, and he, again, he did just such a great job, you know, from when we knew it was a simulant and, and, you know, just kind of the way he was able to kind of portray those things. Like, he, he just did a really good job, and it's a lot. Now, speaking of simulants, because that's obviously the main point of this movie, and obviously they're also the big, I guess, CGI part of this movie, I think we need to applaud the VFX people for their work because the head and obviously this comes into direction again as well. But um, the minimalist approach of the VFX and the heavy emphasis on the practical effects and prosthetics instead of heavy computer CG uh, was perfect because it, it created a feeling of consistency, which especially in smaller, um, especially in kind of these smaller. Uh, what am I trying to say? These in these smaller kind of scaled movies the and and smaller budget movies that the you can have some cgi heavy scenes and then some scenes which really fall short of that and if you just and i think the movie was really strong with the fact that they were able to basically be consistent throughout because they were so they were much more minimal on actual heavy money vfx which means they could kind of you did it didn't feel jarring right because it'll feel sometimes when you it's but even in big blockbuster movies when you used to go from great amazing heavy cgi to like nothing you're like what the hell happened right and so because of the uh you don't see those massive drops you do kind of stay in the movie the entire time which is nice the cgi simplicity also kind of helped the visual depiction of the kind of human tragedy in the smaller scale of the story which was the core of this movie instead of the big vfx and the big fight scenes or whatever which can hurt um which can hurt kind of the what the movie's meant to kind of show and what the themes of the movie actually are um, by, by putting a bunch of, of you know, fun and kind of action over it. For example, Transformers. I don't think there was any story there to put action over, but, you know, if there was a story, it would be deeply impacted by the fact that no one goes to a Transformers movie for a story. Uh, so that mean, so obviously these, these effects really did complement the, the tone of the movie nicely. And so speaking of smaller scale stories, you're going to two transitions like from point to point. That's beautiful stuff for this. Um, this movie managed to do two really magnificent things. The first thing uh, with, like, with the story itself, the first thing they managed to do was interweave three separate storylines together relatively effectively. I mean, obviously it's a very hard thing to do. And there were, however, a few points where they did kind of, you know, make a leap and kind of expected the audience to kind of go along with it, but because they were kind of working within their one and a half hour time frame, or maybe they weren't working within it, but it, because that was kind of, I think their goal was always not to go on for so long. They did have to, they did end up, you know, neglecting some connection points, especially early on in the movie, but I think it still did not affect the kind of end result, which was a heart-wrenching kind of conclusion. And on top of that, I think the second thing they did was they looked, at the at this world and the deep philosophical and, and technical questions but they didn't get sucked into them right they didn't get sucked into this complicated ex, um you know uh exposition and they didn't go on and on about all these technical terms about you know the how the robots work and how the you know the society operates you know for example jurassic world which did a very very poor job at you know making sure that the the robot, the dinosaurs, sorry, not robots, the dinosaurs were explained and they explained the government and then the government affects it and then somehow the last movie ended up being Lotus is it's a whole big mess of the franchise um, or I guess a trilogy because the first three movies were good. But talking about this movie, they don't do that, right? The government is not a factor at all. Uh, the big villain is, I guess, a, technically a company and they don't look at kind of the... They don't really go into depth on the actual robot technology, but they also aren't like you know super inaccurate. And I think part of that is because 
of the way when this movie came out. I think this is where a little bit of it was kind of, I guess, luck, right? And what I mean by that is, I think if this movie came out last year, I don't think you would have gotten maybe the same level of, of a, you know, at least from my part, uh, the acceptance for kind of some of these skipping of terms and, and kind of, you know, brushing over things because over the last few months, AI and obviously through chat, GBT and all this other stuff has become so prevalent in, in our kind of daily vocabulary. I think this movie benefited from obviously when it comes out and it was able to basically say, yeah, well, you know, you kind of understand this stuff anyways. You're not completely new to this, so it's not... Like, if this movie came out three years ago, for example, I think this would not have been sufficient explanation. I think there would be so many questions, but I think, you know, post, obviously, the pandemic and post um, kind of the start of chat, GBT, and all this other AI-type stuff, you really start... To, you see this kind of knowledge of it generally in the mainstream, which means, and obviously, there's a rise in self-driving cars and all this other stuff which means that you can kind of skip over some of this stuff because people are meant to understand. And the other part of it, obviously, is they don't do the whole philosophical deep dive, right? And they don't really go into the, like, oh, well, you know, we've got to talk about the... We've got to give everyone the answers to all the philosophical questions. We've got to give them, you know, long lectures about philosophy. They don't do any of that. They, they ask the questions. They give a little bit of a kind of a framework to kind of debate it and then they let the audience kind of make their own decisions which I think is the way any movie that deals with kind of existential philosophical questions should do it you shouldn't leave, you shouldn't give them the you shouldn't spend time giving people the answer because then why would they think about your movie like if you want to leave a lasting impact you give them something to think about when they're leaving right you give them these deep philosophical questions you've given them basically a very easy framework to kind of analyze it in their own minds from and then they can do that and they can have their own conversations and you can start a conversation and that's how you make uh, a movie which can really have staying power is by really getting people to talk about it, right? And if you just spoon feed them everything, you know, maybe they'll enjoy the movie itself more. But that's even then a possibility. But the second they leave the theater, they're not going to remember what happened, right? I mean, I can, you know, name a whole bunch of people who are movie movies that have done that before. But I'm not going to because, you know, I'm talking about this movie right now. I've name dropped enough movies, um, mainly to trash other movies, but I think that was definitely something which this movie did really well and should be very proud of doing. I and yeah, I think this movie was definitely helped by the last few months, and I think they were kind of able to kind of skirt around the explanations because of the technology increases and jumps. I don't think they could have like I think this would have maybe made a very different review if they if this movie came out three months ago or even you know even like or a year ago to three months ago because i think this wasn't a part of the vocabulary like it is today if you have a south park episode you're pretty much part of the daily conversation in my mind but yeah this movie was again just really well done and overall i think this movie was really good it was a good one and a half hours uh, that didn't drag at all instead it used its time very efficiently and effectively and led to a much cleaner compact story that along with the truly remarkable performances from the entire star-studded cast um the product was a modern shakespearean tragedy with robots it's like a robot shakespearean tragedy kind of i don't know maybe maybe it isn't a shakespearean tragedy maybe it's just a tragedy it's not a comedy i can tell you that much for sure there's some funnier moments but yeah I mean, there's so many things I can talk about, but I'm going to try to keep this, you know, n- no spoilers. So I can't um, really talk about the, one of the scenes I really want to talk about in terms of the actual kind of content of this. But now we're at 14 minutes. So with that being said, thank you all for watching this review. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment. Um, if you're listening to this on podcast apps, subscribe on the podcast app. Leave a review and a rating on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to this. If you're on YouTube, you know, you'd like, you do the, you'd like the subscribing and the comment. It really helps us. Um, and without that, obviously we can't do this stuff because we feel not motivated to do it. And, you know, people, we can't interview people because then people don't want to talk to us. Um, so please, again, subscribe, comment. What did you, if you saw the movie, what do you think of it? And everyone, please, we know we need to support Canadian Film. Actually, I want to, you know, I'm going to do this because 
I air marked out like 20 minutes for this, and I've got time. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a, I'm gonna trash someone a little bit, a little bit trash them. You're like, oh, that's mean. No, it's not mean. Okay. So there's a certain person who is a problem, and it's Barry Hertz. Okay. Now, who is Barry Hertz? You may ask. Barry Hertz, at least as far as I'm aware, is a global Globe and Mail uh, movie critic. I think that's what his actual position is. Um, he's the Barry Hertz is the deputy arts deputy arts editor and film editor for the Globe and Mail. So he wrote a review for this movie. Now I've always had this kind of mixed feeling whenever I see like clips of an article from him. I absolutely hated this one. Um, now it's not because I, I think this, this, I'm going to read you a passage. I think this is probably one of the most damaging things you could ever possibly say. I think he should be ashamed of himself for even writing this because look, you can criticize a movie obviously, but he said, quote, but you will mostly feel sad about the strange state of Cana of Canadian genre cinema and how anyone could have possibly been excited about making such a lifeless, dare I say, mechanical thing such as this. Unplug the electric sheep and send simulant back for a factory recall. Th end quote. Um, this is one of the most despicable things ever written about a Canadian film. Do you know why? Because what you're doing there is you're trashing the entire Canadian film industry. Look, you cannot like a film. You're not going to like every movie ever. That's just an inevitability. Some people like it, some people won't like it. There are obviously people who did not like Simulant. I'm obviously Barriers is one of those people. And but I think there's a difference when you're making commentary, you know, between just attacking everything and, you know, I guess being a true to its form, a film critic, right? And being someone who actually enjoys, appreciates film and wants good film to kind of succeed and, and film that people like. Because remember, at the end of the day, you know, you have more power than you realize. You as in these people, these people who write these things, right? And if you're going to be stuck in this way of just basically trashing everything, Canadian film is never going to be able to get made. Because if you just continue, like, you don't have to like that. I'm not saying, oh, you have to like this or Canadian film is going to die. But what I'm saying is, when you take, when you go after Canadian, because that, that quote was not even a criticism. And that, I think that article was truly just cruel to the movie, which is unnecessary. But... I think when you go after Canadian film like that in that explicit kind of disgusting way, I think that you do damage so much damage to the industry, especially when you have a voice like when you have a platform like this, and then you're literally invoking Canadian cinema as a whole, and you're basically trying to put this negative shadow on it as if there aren't enough people already doing that, you know, in the United States and other places. Like, it's just so shameful that someone is given this platform and, and, and this and, and very impactful platform and chooses to basically just disparage a disparage a Canadian film as a whole when you know you're supposed to be champions of Canadian film and you're not supposed to be attacking it and again that doesn't mean you can't not like a movie or you can't express your dislike that's fair the problem is that when you do it when you do it in a manner where you're it makes you look like you're kind of saying, if this is all Canadian film is, then guess what? You know what happens? People who also, if what if someone watched this movie who's not a Canadian, right? Or doesn't understand important, just doesn't understand kind of Canadian film, right? And they read this review and they're like, wait, so if this is all Canadian film is, why do I, why am I ever going to support a Canadian film? Because in people's minds, I like the way that quote kind of paints it is that Canadian this is just like another example of the terribleness that is Canadian cinema. And that's not true, right? I mean, I enjoyed it. I know a lot of people who enjoyed it. I know people who didn't like it. As I, Art, movies, as art, it's everyone's going to like and dislike things. But when you try to attack, and I feel like that's a fundamental attack on the Canadian film industry, I don't think you should be allowed to have a platform, or at least you should say sorry for being very mean. Um, but unfortunately can't do much besides say I'm disappointed in that and I hope that the and I hope that you know you all like the movie and you go watch it and you go support Canadian film despite what some you know angry people say and 
you know, some people like it, some people won't like it. I think it's, I, I enjoyed it, so that, it is what it is. And, um, you know, if I had to rate this movie a 10, I'd probably go somewhere in kind of the 7.5 to 8 range. Uh, I think it was a very, very good movie. And I think there were a few minor things, but at the end of the day, I had a fun, and it was an hour and a half, which means I wasn't bored out of my mind for half the movie, which is beautiful. Uh, but again, follow me on social media at KalilJamal03. Absolutely, everyone should do that. And thank you all for getting through to the 20 minute mark if you're still listening to it at this point. And comment down below, uh, leave comments in the in the iTunes or Spotify reviews, rate us ideally five stars, but if you don't want to give us five stars, give us one star, I guess. And again, thank you all for watching, subscribe, and see you all next time, bye.